On the next episode of Painting and Travel, Roger and Sarah Bansomer visit the Wapatki National Monument with Merlin George of the Hopi Indian Tribe. So get your brushes out and join us as we tour the Pueblo and capture the moment with paint. Today we are in Arizona at the Wapatki National Monument Park. It's one of the few places I've ever been to where I can see a beautiful 360 degree view all around. And this is a Pueblo village occupied by the Hopi Indians about 900 years ago. We've set up here, I'm going to do a nine by 12 inch painting. I'm using acrylics today, a uh, small variety of brushes, mainly flats a fan brush and a small pointed brush for some details. Uh, for my paints I'm using uh, titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, Indian yellow, cadmium yellow, alizarin crimson, naphthol red, and I put a little bit of burnt sienna out there too. I'll be painting on a masonite board this morning, but uh, while we were traveling through Denver I stopped in an art supply store and picked up some very nice fine weave linen canvas and I glued that to this masonite board. I put a couple of coats of gesso on it and then I put a thin coat of burnt sienna on here for a nice ground to start with, nice warm tone. I chose this composition because I love that dark green tree on the right because it just adds a bit of a hard contrast to this otherwise maybe subtle scene here. Also, there's a small trail that leads down to this Pueblo. I'm standing here on the trail to the Wakuki Pueblo, and the remaining ruins, which you'll see in just a minute, um, were once inhabited by relatives of Merwin George. Your past generations would be about 900 years back that lived here? Yes. And when you stand here, does it feel very special to you? Yes, it seems like I, I come home. And I notice the beauty of the structure itself. Mm -hmm. I'm, I live in Florida much of the year, and I'm always a little disappointed when new buildings and new plazas go up because they don't reflect um, the natural beauty of Florida. Here, however, the structure is in perfect harmony with the natural settings, and I, I, I just think it's spectacular. Why can't we continue that? Um, up in Hopi land, we still have the same, same sort of structures, but what you see right now is is um, the bare bones of the structure. It was really covered up with plaster, everything, and maybe inside was painted too, but it's all, it's all vanished now. And the plaster would have been made of? Uh, Just the local materials here. So that it would have continued to have that wonderful reddish color? Yes. And it would have been a mixture of the natural clay and some of the fine volcanic sand? Yes. So would it, would it have been smoothed over, do you think? Yeah, very smooth. Like um, the Pueblos you see nowadays on Hopi land or Tahos. How do you um, work your day-to-day -day life to remember your past and to feel connected with your people? Well, uh, I got into archaeology and sometimes on the side I make, art, I make arts and crafts such as bows and arrows and rattles to um, to, for the bean dance. And what is that? It's a social dance that we get together um, at the beginning of the year, mostly during the spring, and that's when all the kachinas come back from, uh, from the mountain here, San Francisco Peaks. And what is a kachina? A kachina is a spirit that is either a star or the wind, 
So a natural element that uh, is part of the flow of life? Yes, it's uh, like a part of the circle of life. That sounds very beautiful. It sounds like a meaningful ceremony. Is this just a day long or? Yeah, just during the morning, they, uh, it's just like Christmas to us. During that time, the kids get the kachina dolls and the bows and arrows and the rattles. The boys get the rattles and the bows and the girls get the plaques and the kachina dolls. And what does the name mean? Wukuki. Wukuki. It means big house. Big house. Yes, in Hopi. Yes. And where is the front door? Is it that little keyhole looking opening there? Yes, most likely that would have been um, the front door for defensive purposes, I think. Oh, so it's designed not to let in just anybody easily. Yes. yes. This is mostly family members and you could just imagine um, kids running around and Uncle would be up there and say, hey, son, come in, come yeah. eat. Yes. What do you think they'd be eating for lunch? Uh, piki, mm, you know, cornmeal, mm, maybe uh, stew, I guess, but mo mostly corn and beans, squash. Now, was there a spring near here? Um, I, would, I would think so. Most of the places where, where they set up houses, they would have a spring of mm -hmm. some sort, a water source. Mm -hmm. That must be why they chose this spot. Yes. Must have had some uh, easy access to water, which is saying a lot considering we're in the middle of this huge desert. Yeah. The Painted Desert. Well, back in the days, I guess it was more, more rainy. There was more rain, I guess, and from our oral histories and stuff like that. It was better times back then, I guess. Are the oral histories still passed down? Yes. That's an important part of your life? Yes. Our uncles and um, aunts and our grandpas, we, they, all, they all teach us the stories. And what age are you when you start hearing the oral history? About uh, five years old. Mm -hmm. And when do you start giving it back? Uh, about this time. Mm -hmm. I got um, little nieces and nephews and I hope to pass that on to them too. Merwin said this door is very good for defense because when the bad guy comes out, you can whack him. So this uh, seems almost like a stage kind of an area here. What is this spot? Yeah, this uh, would look like a plaza to me. Yes? Uh, where they would um, dance, have dances, and you know, just uh, bring the, the corn from the fields. and separate them, the beans and squash and stuff, and have them hanging out. I think the early stages of a painting are often the most enjoyable and the most fun. Uh, it's where everything gets established. And uh, a good composition or a composition can either make or break the painting. So it's important that I try and get this as accurate as I can. This is a good opportunity to use thirds when dividing my canvas up. This horizon line was more or less on the top third, and this Pueblo will be over here on this third over here. So I have a nice balance. Also, there's a beautiful little path that comes down here, makes a great little S-curve. Then here we've got just some other landscape features, and there's a beautiful green color I've noticed all throughout the West uh, with this plant. I'm not sure what it is. It's a sagebrush or something, but it has a, a beautiful pale green color to it. And I've been wanting to paint this ever since we've gotten out here. And this is my chance, I guess. So I'll just uh, maybe sketch in a few places where this is going to be. These little shrubs. This will help to make the foreground a little more interesting as well. I might take some other colors out of my palette as I go along here, but the colors on my palette, I've sort of settled down with those for a while. I often put other colors out on my palette, but right now I'm really using the three primary colors, the blue, yellow, and red, and there's a warm and a cool color of each one of those primary colors. So we have a cool blue and a warm blue, and so on. I think that'll make a good composition. So 
Now that I've got it sketched in, I'm happy with what that looks like. I'll pick up a larger brush and I'll start putting in some of my big masses. I usually start with my darks and work towards the lights. I start with transparent colors and work towards opaque colors. So I'll start with these darks, ultramarine blue, lizard and crimson, a little bit of Indian yellow. That'll give me a nice warm tone. If I want to make it warmer, I just put in a little more alizarin crimson. These are all transparent colors. I'm enjoying working on this panel board with this nice fine linen canvas on it. It gives me a little bit, a little bit more texture than just working on a, a masonite board. Ultramarine blue, Indian yellow will give me a nice dark green. Put a little bit of cadmium red in there. This is not one of the most visited National Monuments parks in the area, but uh, there are a number of visitors coming up here. Several days ago, Sarah and I spent a few days in the Grand Canyon National Park, and that is just the, the most amazing place that I've ever been. Uh, it's very hard to capture what took millions of years to create in just, you know, a half hour or an hour, but I did manage to do a few uh, paintings on location there, and uh, I guess I can show those to you now. Here I sat right on the rim of the canyon, and uh, just with uh, tourists and everyone else going by, I really enjoyed uh, painting the scene. The light keeps changing here as it does everywhere, and the more distant the subject, the more panoramic the subject, the more the light can change on us. So as clouds go over, this will all change. Right now this Pueblo is very dark, but I just, I love that look of that. So I'm going to put this in here quite dark. Well, as you can see, we have a cloud now and just a patch of light on this. It keeps changing. This is one of the major problems painting outside is just this constantly changing light. I'm not sure how other artists deal with it. I'm not sure how I deal with it. Uh, you just sort of have to cope with it. Well, I think I'll take a little bit more burnt sienna, maybe cerulean blue this time. Well, I also bring this little spray bottle with me. I can spray that, spray those paints up there, keep them wet a little bit longer. I'm going to keep this very thin now. And even though I have a wash here of burnt sienna, I'm going to continue to make this a little bit darker. I love this for the real historical value and significance of this site to think that people lived here so long ago, but a uh, popular movie in the 60s was also filmed here called Easy Rider. It's true. <laughs> That's what they said. I was listening to their interview. I've got my darks in, I've got my middle tones here. Now I'm gonna start with some of my light areas. It's important for me to get those three values established in my painting, light, middle tone, and dark, before I start to add too much more detail. If I use vertical brush strokes to paint the sky, uh, it can of often give me sort of an uplifting look to the sky as opposed to a lot of horizontal strokes. Now it can become a problem when you're trying to blend your colors a little bit, but uh, a little bit of practice, it's not bad. So down here, it's always gonna be lighter than of course in the zenith. So I'm going to take a little bit of um, cadmium yellow light and lighten this up down here just a bit. I think I'll spray this too with my little atomizer. A lot of it's, it's a little bit windy here. Some of the spray comes back in my face. Actually feels pretty good. <laughs> so I can blend these lighter colors and then just work my vertical strokes back into it. As things are in the distance, of course there's more atmosphere between here and the distance there, which is a long way away. Uh, it's a very warm color back there, but I want to keep it about the same value as the sky, a little bit darker and a little bit warmer. Wow. 
It's just amazing to be here. I just, I just love, I love painting out here. When I start to set up, I'm always questioning myself as to, gosh, can I really, can I really do a painting out here? Can I really accomplish this? But then once I, I get into it, and it doesn't take long, a few minutes, then all those uh, concerns sort of fall away. Now this is a little bit closer to the foreground. So I'm gonna make this a little bit darker, a little more contrast here than in the very back. I'm letting some of this burnt sienna color in the background show through. It will help to keep this nice warm tone to this painting. I'm going to pick up one more color, put it on my palette. This is chromium oxide green. It's a very opaque color, but these, uh, this sagebrush has this very beautiful pale green to it. Instead of trying to mix that color, this will save me just a little bit of time because it's almost just the right color that I need. I'm using the edge of my brush, I'm going to wipe my paint off my brush and just sort of use this as a dry brush here. Maybe a touch of Indian yellow with this because I don't, I want to keep my colors varied. They're, actually, when I look at all these plants, they all look the same color, but on my painting, I uh, want to get some variation. Some of these will have a little bit more cerulean blue, some a little more yellow, and so on. Having this burnt sienna undertone is just a lifesaver. If I were to start out with a white canvas here, it would make this whole painting process so much more difficult. See how that nice warm color shows through there? What I'm trying to do here is make this, this sagebrush here in the foreground a little bit warmer than the sagebrush in the background. That will give me a little sense of distance. Even though I can't see it that way, technically I know that that will help give me some, some uh, atmosphere between the foreground and the background. Painting outside, I have found, and I'm sure if you paint you have found this too, that just painting out here in the sun, when I bring this painting inside, these colors are going to look much darker. There's some other beautiful yellow plants down here. I th think they're called snake plants, uh, but they're bright yellow bushes. And I think I will try and add a few of those in. Of course, the flowers are on top of the bush. So if I add some darker color underneath here, Say about like that. I think I'll keep this fairly warm. These dark colors here, fairly warm there. Then I can add the lighter flowers over this. I don't think I want too many of those in there. It may be a little distracting. It may take away from the main focal point here. So I'll keep these quite subtle. Well, I think now it's time to add some highlights across these rocks. So this is where I start to use my opaque colors. So I'll use, um, of course, anytime I put white in any of the colors, even if they're transparent, it makes them opaque. So this lighter color here that I've mixed with primarily Indian yellow, which is transparent, but I'll put some white in that. I've mixed a little bit of naphthol red. This will give me what I think might be a nice highlight color. Well, right now the sun has come across and it gives me a nice sort of a division point right here to divide this uh, little plateau here with the uh, Pueblo back here. So I can, see it's gone already. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting all my keys, I'm getting all my information from that, but the information changes all the time. So I have to take that information that I see there, so I need to transpose that into my own vision. That little S-curve couldn't come at a, a nicer spot in this painting. Just it sort of leads your eye into this center of interest here. As I put these colors on here, I immediately realize if I have too much highlight, too much contrast here, it's going to really take away from this nice abstract form. So I'm going to keep these highlights kind of to a minimum. I started to put this highlight on here. It's almost the same value. Problem is, I started to make it a uh, cool color. Really should be a warm color here on this sunny side. Now one important thing that I haven't dealt with yet is the, is the outline, is that the actual shape 
of this. I need to define that a little more so it really start to look like a Pueblo. Well, I haven't dealt much with this foreground here. I like to keep the whole painting working at once. So I think I'll jump in here and do a little more to the foreground. There are over 600 non-active volcanoes in this area. And that's where all this black uh, uh, rock comes from. So we've got a lot of this black mixed in with this uh, reddish color. I don't have black on my palette, but I don't really feel like I need it. I do use it sometimes. This is just full of color here. I just see color everywhere, but it's very subtle color. Can't use, I can't use colors right out of the tube here because they would just look totally wrong. And that's the case with most landscape paintings. Although there's a lot of color, it's, it's subtle color. Oh, I see a beautiful dark, dark shadow coming across that main structure there now. Let me grab that before I lose it. In fact, I think I'll make that a little bit lighter just so this dark shadow will show up. I'm going to expand on this shadow a little bit because I know as the day goes on, this shadow is going to get, get a little bit bigger there. That, that gives me a little bit of form. It describes this building a little bit better. Wow, that just gives a nice, beautiful, warm tone in there. Put this window in here. Even though it's small, it's very descriptive. It really will tell me or tell the viewer what this is. There's another, there's a couple of doors down there. And uh, so I think I'll make this one lighter, a little bit lighter, just like I did here. Then I can put this doorway in here. There. And that really describes that this is a building. But now I want to con keep concentrating on this. This is my center of interest. This needs more work too. I could finish this back in the studio and I may, but right now when I'm at this site, I want to try and get as much feeling as I can with this little building. So I'm gonna take my third step. I've got my darks, I've got my middle tones. Now I'm gonna just touch it here and there with some strong highlights. I don't want to make these highlights too prominent or I'll lose this abstract shape I've got. This is a very flat area right here. So that's catching a lot of sunlight from overhead. Right by this window, we'll just put a touch of a highlight there. One more thing I wanted to get in here before I leave, and that is, that deals with some shadows down here. The shadow tends to be cool. So under this rock, I'll have a cooler shadow because it's a cast shadow. The shadow under this rock, as you can see by this close up, is a very cool color. Now, all these colors are in relationship to another color. So when I say cool color or warm color, it can be in it has to be thought of in relationship to another color, either next to it or something else on the canvas. As you can see here, looking closely at this rock, the upper portion of this rock tends to be very warm. And that's because it's getting the reflected light from the ground. So the shadow, even though these are both in shadow, one of them is a cast shadow and one of them is just in shadow. And there's a difference. And I need to make them about the same value. That's important because when I squint my eyes, as you can see, those two colors are about the same value. I can't, if I were to make this black and white here, we'll just make it black and white here for a minute so you can see. Now you can see that the two values are, there's no difference. But when we put color back into that, the rock at the top is warmer than the rock underneath. So we've got cool cast shadow, and then we've got a warmer shadow here because of the reflected light from the ground. This gets all a little bit complicated and uh, convoluted maybe because there's so many factors involved. It, you know, local color, if there was green grass under that, the color may be different and so on. But that's, uh, 
that's how I see this. And uh, I often have to bounce back and forth between what I know is there and what I see is there. Well, this has been a great day. I'm going to finish this painting back in the studio. It's really been an honor and a privilege to be here. This 360 degree view is something I've never seen before. We were here, Sarah and I were here late in the evening yesterday and I've never seen a place that's as quiet as this. It was just amazing. We have some visitors here now, so we, I hear some footsteps and so on, but wow, to be here is just uh, is fabulous and to be able to paint this. Uh, there are many, there are uh, petroglyphs in this area and uh, to think that I'm painting here too, along with people that painted 900 years ago, pretty special thing. So we'll take this back to the studio. I'll finish it there, put a frame on it, and uh, we'll see what it looks like. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.